uh, in dive film scope had started since last, last century by the production of the Helmholtz, uh, uh, the direct thermoscope in 1851. And again, in 1852 came the indirect monocular uh, with independent light source. Uh, and then in 1861 uh, came the indirect binocular with independent light source with uh, uh, Girard. The real modern indirect thermoscope came with Skippens in 1951, who is supposed to be the father of real uh, new retinal surgery. Indirect thermoscope is an essential, detailed, panoramic, and complete examination of the retina. What advantage we get from the indirect thermoscope? The image is not affected by the refractive error of the patient. So the patient is myope, hypermetrope, <coughs> is not affected by this uh, point. In children, nystagmus, delivery of the laser, we use it very frequently when we get at the end of the surgery uh, in vitrectomy to deliver uh, a laser while getting a hazy media at the end of the surgery is very easy to do it through the dark uh, system. Again, people who are working with retinopsy of prematurity are very, have to be very efficient in using the indirect laser in delivery of uh, this machine. We can get binocular examination of the fundus up to the periphery and again, a larger field of view. You get a general topography examination of the retina. Actually, this is a picture by the Optopus, a new machine which constructs the, the image of the retina in one shot in a panoramic uh, image, in a panoramic image. But with the indirect thermoscope, we can get the same image by but by with drawing. You can draw different parts of the retina to get the same image. Again, the advantages include better resolution, use, the, uh, use in the operating room for sclera buckling and cry application, better view in the presence of media opacity, increased illumination, reduced distortion, and additional advantages <coughs> is that the, uh, the doctor is at a distance from the patient, especially <coughs> if you get bad odor from the patient, <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> the optics of the indirect thermoscope depends on a condensing lens which projects light to the patient's eye, <coughs> and the thing is called indirect because the fundus is, is seen through a condensing lens. The image is formed close to the principal focus of the lens between the lens and the observer. The, the retina could be light uh, up by using the light source in the indirect. And then interrupting this image coming out of the retina by a condensing lens, we get an inverted image of the retina. And we view the aerial image with the magnifier. The magnifier is the lens we are using to see this image. The power of condensing lens is very important. So you have to know which lens you are using. If you are using a low power lens like the 14 diopters, you get a higher magnification, low field of view, very narrow field of view, and the working distance from the cornea is increased. You know, if you are basic, you use that. But if you are advanced and doing vitreous and retinal surgery, if you think about the biome and the recite, it is the same principle. During focusing on the retina, during vitrectomy or vitreous surgery, if you get closer with the biome or the recite to the cornea of the patient, you get a larger view. Same like the indirect surgery. Again, if you go with the power of the lens to plus 30, then you get lower, uh, a wider field of view, lower uh, magnification, and lower working distance. And then, if you get to the high power, you want a very large view, a panoramic view, <coughs> go for the plus 30 lens. 
What are the, the disadvantages? It's difficult to master. Small movement alter significantly the size and clarity. Inverted and reverse image, and you have to, your brain to be inverted and reverse to get to un interpret what you are seeing. The relative lack of magnification. But we have to go step by step how to use the instrument. There are very essential steps during use of the direct microscope to get the proper examination method. First, adjusting the instrument, positioning the patient, the examination proper and clear indentation, the fundus drawing. You have to adjust the eyepiece and the headband. Although it seems that this is very un not important step, but really it's a very important step. If you don't adjust the instrument, the instrument on your head, you won't be comfortable during the examination, and you are be very in a very hurry. You are very hurry to to finish the exam without getting the needed detail. And you have to adjust the housing for the light to be parallel to your face. Otherwise, if it's tilted, you will get a tilted image. These basic steps are very important during your uh, starting <coughs> journey to get good ideas from the entire telescope. Again, the IPG knob, you, get to, uh, you have to adjust it in front of you, both your pupils. Otherwise, you will get monocular field or monocular examination, and then you will not get the benefit you need from the indirect from school. You adjust the IPG by concentrating the light on your finger and trying to get a single image from both sides of the, of the indirect. Again, aperture setting, you have an up to adjust the aperture because some, sometimes you get a narrow pupil, you put the narrow beam so that the light goes through the pupil and both your binocular goes through your pupil. Otherwise, you get a non-stereoptic vision. Again, we have a filter knob to put uh, red-green filters, cobalt blue filters, or neutral density filters, and a rheostat to decrease and increase the intensity of light. Again, this is very important, because if you put, you want to put the light on the maximum to see the maximum, but actually, if you put the light on the maximum and put it in the patient's eye, the patient will get very annoyed and you will lose <coughs> the cooperation of the patient with you to get the needed information. And the, the position of the of some scope should be perpendicular to the visual axis of the patient, of the examiner, I'm sorry. The scope not resting on the nose. Don't let the scope to be resting on your nose. You will be, get very irritated by time and you will stop the examination in the proper way. The eyepiece close to the examiner pupils as, as close as possible. <coughs> and adequately adjust the IPD. Now the patient should be resting on the, 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 the table in the parallel position. Don't get him flexed or hyperextended. And again, this position applies to the biome and the recite during vitreous surgery. If you get the patient during surgery in this position, you will lose most of your viewing of the retina and the vitreous. Uh, the patient helps uh, uh, help him to see and move his eyes in all cardinal position and encourage him all the time to keep the other eye open. Uh, uh, the the forefinger of the, the middle finger of the hand you holding the condensing lens should be used as a pivot. The movement of your hand moves on this pivot. 
either to the right or the left. It's clear depression, although most of the, the authors uh, uh, advise for scared depression, I personally don't do it. I do it in the operating room because most of the cooperation of the patient is lost during scared depression. Anyway, it's described and it's very important in the operating room if you are going to do retinal surgery. You just put the depressor on the uh, upper eyelid of the patient, gently slip it in the upper uh, fornix and let the patient to look upwards and you get clear depression. And as we all know, most of the lesions we need to know and see in retinal surgery is located at the periphery. And if you de don't depress this area, either preoperatively or postoperatively, you will get <coughs> failures of the surgery because of uh, skipping this step. The, the alignment of the eyepiece, condensing lens, pupil, and scared depression on the visual axis, criti critical in obtaining the binocular stereoscopic view. As I told you, both your pupil and both the light, all three uh, items should pass through the pupil of the patient to get a stereoscopic uh, picture. Now, it's the time for drawing. And drawing is very important. If you cannot draw the topography of the retinal attachment, you cannot uh, um, see, uh, you cannot describe what you have seen. <coughs> and as you all know, the famous chart for drawing of the retina with all these three circles. And the first circles highlights the junction between the pars plicata and the pars plana. The second is the aura. And the third is the equator. And this chart is called Amsler the Po chart. Whenever you draw the patient, you have to put the chart on his chest. Why? Because an easy, very easy trick to overcome the upside and the reversing of the image is to put the chart upside down. <coughs> the six o'clock for the patient at the six o'clock for the chart and vice versa. So whatever you see, you draw it in the chart and then when you flip the chart at the end, everything is back to its place. What is important for the tips of for drawing, and again, this is tips for your uh, integration, your mental integration of what you see. <coughs> Disregard superior to inferior temporal laser while drawing. Don't think what you are looking at. Just look at an area and draw what you see in the lens on the chart in its position. And don't think it's upper temporal or nasal. Whenever you finish your drawing, everything is, will come in its real uh, position. This trick is very important. And all the time think about it. Whatever appears closer to the observer in the condensing lens is preferred or anterior to the position, in position. So what you see in the mirror, prefer, it's actually the preferred part of the retina. So what I say always to my fellows during using the indirect, whenever you think about the indirect, think that you are sitting yourself on the parse planner and looking back to the optic disc. And then what you are going to see is in the same order. What's closer to you is more preferred in position. Observe the disc and follow a vessel to the periphery. Observe the <coughs> macula at the end of the examination because if you start in the beginning, it will be, be very harmful to the patient and these pupil will close and you will see nothing in the next steps. Again, draw as you see the region in the condensing lens. As you can see, 
we are concentrating in this position to the 11 clock position. And this is the lens. What appears closer to you or peripheral to the lens is anterior in position. Okay? And then when you look backwards, you are sitting here and looking backwards towards the optic disc. And all the, the orientation of the layers comes as ever you are looking back to the optic disc. Again, shifting from one position to another, and this is important during surgery, because you have to know if you are using the cryo and treating lesion and using the indirect, and then you find a lesion on, the, on the, your right side, you have to move to the left side because actually it's reversed upside and from side to side. Finally, there are some international uh, uh, color schemes which you have to know. There are red solid colors in the retinal arterioles, new vascularization, vascular anomalies attached uh, retina. <coughs> Red growth. If I'm passing the line, the time just let me know. From this uh, uh, drawing, we get red crossed uh, uh, lines in open portion of GRT or giant retinal break, inner portion of uh, gent, uh, GRA or giant retinal break, inner portion of the thin area of the retina. As you can see, this is the red crossed lines. Blue solid, vitro retinal traction tuft, outline of lattice degeneration, inner excises, uh, outline of thin area of the retina. <laughs> Blue solid, as I told you, detached retina, retinal veins, outlines of retinal breaks. Blue crossed line, inner layer of retinoscises, white with or without uh, pressure, as we see in this area. Detached parse planar epithelium, anterior separation of the aura serrata. Blue circle or interrupted line in cystoid degeneration, outline change in the area of folds of the detached retina. Green solid opacities in the media as vitreous opacities, vitreous hemorrhage, vitreous membranes, and as we see, these green areas represent mainly opacities in the vitreous. We can get green dotted as asteroid halosis, frosting of snowflakes on the retinoscises, lattice degeneration, brown solids in pigment epithelial detachment, choroidal melanomas, nevus, yellow solid in hard exudation, gliosis deposits in the retinal pigment epithelium. And finally, this is a video clip showing the technique just to illustrate and review the previous uh, 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 slides I had told you about. <coughs> this is the start of the clinical examination, patient preparation fundus examination and drawing. This is the patient lying just parallel to the table, adjusting the rear stat to get a lower light, not directing the light directly to the macula at the first time, or other you are going to lose the cooperation of the patient. The patient should be resting and he is instructed to open his other eye all the time, not to close it, and then you direct the light to the pupil. The pupil should be fully dilated and use the beam 
as equal as to the size of the pupil, <coughs> interrupt the light by putting the condensing lens and trying to move the lens forward and backward to get to get um, sorry to get the wider field and clear image. What I just want to to to, uh, to let you know that there is a white line on the condensing lens which denotes which is the side should be directed to the patient. This white edge of the lens should be to the side of the patient, not to your side. Now we have to examine the image. Image is inverted from side to side and upside down, so the inferior is, is superior and the nasal is temperate. This is the technique of scare depression, but I, I, I personally don't recommend for my patients. Uh, uh, this is very important. The part I, I told you about The light and both pupils of the examiner should pass through the pupil of the patient to get a binocular image. The final point I want just to clarify. During for you who are going to go for the OR to treat retinal attachment. This is the picture during sclear depression. And again, what appears closer to the lens, in the lens to you, is peripheral. And that's what you should concentrate on, to find the location of retinal breaks. Because before surgery, you had located the break. But during surgery, you have to confirm that during your skinner uh, depression. Thank you. This is a picture actually from Luxor. Uh, and uh, you are uh, uh, invited all the time to come to Egypt to enjoy this beautiful balloon uh, flying all over Luxor. <laughs>